So the next couple of videos are probably the most important ones in the whole Blues Raga guitar series because they contain my ideas about the secrets of blues melodies, the DNA phrases that define the whole genre. These are melodies that you're going to find in the earliest field calls and all the early spirituals. They're all throughout the songs of the bluesmen like Robert Johnson and Blind Lemon, and they're in the most modern blues rock. They are in everything. These are phrases that carry the spirit of the blues with them anywhere they go. Um, and studying these is probably the most useful idea about improvisation I've ever discovered. Um, for me, this really transformed my playing when I started thinking this way, and I just hope you guys find it as useful as I've found it, because I'm just going to lay it all out here as best I can. I'm going to start with a real brief explanation of Raga theory, because as much as I kind of want to jump right into showing you the phrases, it might be a little confusing if I don't start with um, a little bit of context about how I got to this idea. Uh, but you know, right after I move through that, I'm going to show you three types of DNA phrases. These are really, really simple melodic ideas, but that you find in anything that sounds bluesy. These really define the sound of the blues, really anywhere they go. Um, and once I've kind of introduced you to those, I'm going to kind of explain all the miraculous advantages of knowing these. And like I said, th th this has affected me as a musician in so many ways, and I think you guys are going to find the same thing. Uh, try to use the lesson navigator below if you want to get to the different parts of the lesson, jump your way around to all the things we're going to do here. Uh, yeah, let's get into it. So the whole idea behind this series is that we're using the ragas, an Indian musical form, as a template for how we approach the blues. And to a lot of people, this might not make any sense. And I mean, I'm just going to ask you to take on faith that when I studied the ragas, it helped me understand literally every other kind of music I've come across. Um, I've be able to apply those ideas to you know old music, to music from all over the world. It's not a perfect way to describe everything, but the blues is probably the closest type of music that I've found to the ragas. And it's, it's actually really weird because the ragas and the blues really didn't develop anywhere geographically near each other, but this, the rules of the ragas apply so well to how the blues works. It's really uncanny. So um, I have a feeling if you dive into this, you're going to find the same thing. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to start out with explaining. When you learn a raga, there's a couple things you do right off the bat. The first thing you study about a raga is, you know, the scale. What notes are you using for it? And once you've taken care of that, then the teacher tells you which notes are the most important in the raga. Now, some of that comes from just the way people hear music. Certain intervals just sound more stable and more normal to people, no matter where they're from. But then also when you play the ragas, you learn to do certain tricks to make other notes sound more important than other ones. So you learn about this hierarchy of notes within the raga, which are the big notes, which are the little notes, and which are the, quote, wrong notes, too. And then you, you learn the chalons next. And the chalons are kind of how you make the notes sound at these different levels of importance. And these chalons are, these are the DNA phrases. And the way you kind of know that something's a chalon, I've mentioned this a little bit before, is that it's usually between two and four notes. It's not usually one note, it's not usually five notes, it's usually two, three, or four notes. And there, these couple notes are played in a very specific way. The way you do the slide or the way you do the bend is, is always very, very specific. And for someone who has grown up listening to whatever kind of music you're playing, uh, they can usually identify what kind of music you're playing right away just by the way these couple of notes are playing. It's a very catchy sound. You know, that's really how you define what a chalon is. Just a couple notes played in a very special way and it really characterizes the sound of the genre so much that someone can know what it is right away if they know what you're playing. And it's really funny because this this idea appeals to a very universal characteristic of musical language. It's why raga theory works for so many things. I'm not going to get into that too much here, but I just want you to understand that it's a it, it's something universal about musical language that this appeals to, and that's why it works for so many um, types of music. Uh, and the most important theory you need to understand about ragas as we go on uh, with this series is this concept of parallel interval structures. I'm going to explain this by uh, teaching you a little bit about rag yaman. Yaman is one of the first rags you learn when you study North Indian classical music. It's based on a Lydian scale. If we're doing it in E, it's like E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B, C sharp, D sharp, E. And um, just because of the way humans perceive intervals, this root and this fifth, they tend to sound like very, very stable notes. But when you're taught Yaman, you're taught to make the seventh degree of the scale, this D sharp and this G sharp, 
to sound like the main notes. And uh, the way you do that is you, is you use this particular phrase. It goes like this. It's kind of a funny phrase because you're starting down here. This is the root. You start right below the root. You kind of skip over it. But it's kind of that avoiding the root that kind of makes Yaman sound neat. It's the weirdness that makes it unique. And, and the way this, uh, this chalan gets expanded throughout the raga is through a parallel interval structure. You see, with, with, this, um, with the root in a Lydian scale, right below it, the note right below it is a half step below. And then the two notes above it are whole steps apart. And the funny thing is, if you look at the fifth degree of the scale, this B here, the same interval structures occur on the, on the sides of it, below it. It's a half step. It's a whole step and then another whole step above it. Exactly the same way it was at the root. So you can play that same little melodic phrase in both places. You can go... You can go... And you see it sounds kind of similar, but not exactly the same. And so that's a way of expanding this really basic idea in a way that's familiar to the ear, but kind of makes it feel a little more interesting than if you just play the same thing again and again. And this is how the ragas develop. They start with these very, very simple ideas, and they use the natural hierarchy of notes to expand them in a very simple way. And this appeals to the ear. The ear tends to like simple things, simple sounds, very um, finite ways of using notes, only moving between notes in certain ways. That's what makes like tonal music sound sweet. And you know, as you get more advanced with this type of music, you start to use more and more different ways of using the phrases, more advanced relationships, more and more wrong notes. Like by the time you get to jazz, jazz basically in a way plays all the wrong notes on purpose. That's part of what makes it sound interesting because it's really playing with really, really heavy dissonances a lot. And um, more advanced listeners tend to like that. But when you're starting out with melodic music, uh, people tend to like to hear simpler things, and the ragas is really, really good at that. It helps you figure out how to expand a very simple idea in a way that still sounds really good, but you know do, that minimizes the amount of material you have to use. And so when you're learning chalons, you learn how to use parallel interval structures to create these feelings. So uh, yeah, that, that, um, that explains the most important things about raga theory. Let me, I think we're ready to go on and talk about the DNA phrases now. So in my way of thinking, there are three types of DNA phrases. Um, each of these types of phrases has a lot of variations, a lot of specific ways that it's played, but you know, they, they, they're all tied together by some common things, and they're really, really recognizable. These are really important in defining the sound of blues melodies. And uh, I'm, in, this, in this video, I'm going to introduce the concepts of these phrases, and in the next two videos, I'm going to show you as many of the detailed ways of playing them as I can. I'm going to show you just you know, every little bitty thing about how you bend the notes and how you slide the notes and all that stuff. And I'm also going to give you what I call the master DNA exercises. These are ways to run these phrases into your playing so that you can improvise with them really, really fluidly. This was probably the most important exercise for improvisation that I've ever used. It really, really changed my playing for the better. So I'm really hoping you guys will find that useful. Uh, let me start out by talking about what I call the blues thirds. This is the first type of phrase and definitely the most unique, most characteristic of the blues. Uh, for Usually these are two note phrases, sometimes three. Uh, let me give you a real quick demo of these. You know, if I start here, an A minor. Now that phrase right there used a bunch of these blues thirds. If I started it out, I kind of bent those notes. I kind of I kind of slid over that one, I kind of hammered over that fret there. But what's common between all those little fragments that made up that longer lick is they all involve a stable note, a kind of a lower stable note, and then an upper note that's a third above the lower note, and you kind of smear, you kind of blur into that note from below. There's a bunch of ways to do it, but every single one of those licks, you know, the first lick started on this A, it's kind of a stable note in A minor, it's the root. And you take this note that's a minor third above and you kind of bend it up into the major third. And over here I kind of took... I kind of slid over that note, this note I kind of started on the A down here and hammered over the fret. Those are all basic ways of taking either a major or a minor third and sort of 
you know, smearing into it from below. And that's, this is really what makes the blues so interesting because some people ask, is the blues major, is the blues minor? Well, you're going to see that the blues plays with this concept of major and minor a lot. It blurs the line between major and minor with this lick more than anything. With This whole type of lick is about blurring the line between major and minor. And the way that the blues does it, um, it's very difficult to find things that are like this in any other style of music. It makes the blues sound like what it is more than any other type of lick, at least in my opinion. Um, so in the next video, I'll get into all the details of how to do that, but you'll see it's all about taking just two notes You know a stable note and a note a third above it and kind of blurring the line from below um, That's how that type of lick works. Uh, the next type is what I call chromatic walks. I'll give you a real quick demo for an A here And you're gonna see if I'm an A minor pentatonic, I'm taking the major notes and I'm filling in the space between them with chromatic notes. Connecting those two notes. Connecting these two notes. I'm just, I'm just filling in the notes chromatically in between. And this lick probably came into the blues through European influence. When the blues was forming, it was a it was a very much a, a confluence of European classical ideas and the ideas of the African American slaves. And you're going to hear, especially like in ragtime, which is a really early kind of piano genre of the blues, there's a lot of influence from Romantic era piano music. And so sometimes this, this lick can, sometimes, if you're not careful, it can start to sound like it's European classical music. The way the blues maintains its kind of stamp on chromatic licks is which scale degrees it connects. Um, it tends to, you know, take the pentatonic scales and connect certain notes between them with these chromatics, you know, on a very consistent basis, and that way the ear can kind of get used to which scale degrees it's happening on. I mean, if you, for those of you who listen to Robert Johnson, you're going to hear this. He has a bunch of songs that use elixir like this. Right there. See, when he goes... See that chromatic line? Tons and tons of blues artists have taken that particular tonal motion and used it in their licks, and it's become so common in blues artists, you can't miss it. Another way to do that similar lick is to go... See, it's embellished a little bit, but that chromatic line is still in there, and you, it, it's hard to think of that as being anything other than a blues lick, just because of the way blues artists use it. So as long as you know which scale degrees are being connected and in which direction, you can use those licks to really, really deepen the blues sound. And it's, it, it's hard to find blues music that doesn't have those in it, in one way or another. Um, okay, so that covers the basics of chromatic walks. The last type of blues lick that I think is really important is what I call pentatonic fourths. And this type of blues lick is a little bit more wishy-washy because a lot of different types of music use the pentatonic scale. You find it in folk music all over the world. Indian classical, Chinese classical music use the pentatonic scale a lot. And we're talking about the kind of the normal Western you know, classical blues pentatonic scale. A lot of other styles share that. And so if you're not really careful about how you play it, these licks can easily sound like something else. But again, like the other types of licks, there's certain ways of playing these pentatonic fourths that are unmistakably bluesy. If you listen to so much of the early stuff, all, so many of the early shuffle types of blues, you get... All I'm playing around with is three notes there. I'm talking about you know, this E here, this G here, this A here. And the outer notes, the E and the A, they're a fourth apart. And then there's this note on the inside. And in, in different parts of the pentatonic scale, there can be a different inside interval. And that can define what types of licks you use it in. And you you can also define these licks about by which note in that little fourth box gets the weight. You know, is, is it the top note in it that you're you kind of leading up to the top note? Are you kind of falling down to the bottom note? Or are you kind of circling around the middle note? You know, I find you can classify these licks pretty well by using those ideas. Um, but one other thing that you're going to see with this type of lick is really important is the rhythm. Because when it's, when it's not as clear where the lick is coming from, you know, the shuffle rhythm is what makes that kind of New Orleans blues lick work. When that shuffle rhythm is... The shuffle rhythm 
is going to make it a lot easier to recognize what that is. So as you go on, you're going to find things beyond just the notes will sometimes help you make things sound bluesy, but even certain just orders of notes, you know, are, are enough. With the blues thirds, usually just the order of the notes is enough to make it sound like a blues lick. Um, but eventually we're going to get into talking about how, you know, it's a whole package. How do you do everything in your playing to make things sound like a blues lick? Um, but in the next video, I'm going to try to give you a lot more specifics about how to use those pentatonic fourths to, you know, play really, really specific blues licks from different, different genres of, of the blues. And, uh, yeah, those, those are the basic, the most important ideas about the blues licks right there. So some of you might not be totally sold on this idea of the DNA phrases yet. Because, I mean, I think one of the obvious questions you're going to ask is, man, Eric Clapton didn't think like this, Stevie Ray Vaughan didn't think like this, Robert Johnson didn't think like this, and they were all great blues players, so why do I need this idea? And, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of the early blues players, they didn't think the way I'm talking about thinking, and they were great musicians, they were great artists. I still have a weird feeling if they knew about this idea, they would have at least liked it or been able to use it, but uh, the, the most important thing about... Um, taking this approach of using DNA phrases is that it just gives you a lot more resources to work with. I would go even so far as to say, it's a really bold statement, but I would go so far as to say thinking in DNA phrases literally makes you smarter. Uh, it seems like kind of a ridiculous thing, but I mean, think about it this way. Um, let, let's say you just are listening to blues music and you, and you hear some lick that you really like. And you're like, man, I want to try to remember what it is. Well, right off the bat, if you try to remember every single note that you heard, that's really, really cumbersome from the brain. And you try to think, oh, is it A and then B and then D and it slides over that thing? It's just a lot to think about. But when you've got things broken down into these little building blocks, um, it, it lets you think of things in larger pieces. So instead of having to remember like 17 notes, you can remember five core phrases and you know that just it's just easier to remember and i'm just going to tell you from experience these core phrase types they show up in a lot of things so as long as you're thinking of the right things as long as you've worked with the right phrases you're going to find them showing up everywhere and it's going to be easier to organize larger groups of ideas and that just makes them easier to remember so in that way you can just hear the blues better you can play it better and when you're breaking things down in a solo or you're practicing things you can see things in so much more detail and it gives you a lot more options in terms of how you manipulate your sound and your style. And, and it, when, you, when you talk about style, you know, a lot of people are going to tend to think that the theory is going to bog them down, it's going to slow them down. And I mean, another thing I'm going to ask you to take on faith is that that's actually not what ends up happening. After you've practiced this idea for a while, a really, really different experience takes place. When I play blues solos, I'm usually, I don't feel like I'm thinking about theory. I feel like I'm just going at it. Uh, but the the way that emerges is I start I started out by thinking of you know the different notes in the pentatonic scale and how they felt to me and then how these licks laid into them but they're such simple ideas that after I spent enough time with them they just kind of start to a color to acquire a character and a personality and things beyond just you know these black and white notes on the frets and and understanding you know why the different notes feel the way they do just helps your imagination get into it so much more and it helps the blues kind of take on a life of its own so that when you play the theory is more of a the theory becomes more of a feeling than like a mathematical idea the more time you spend with it and these simple ideas are so much easier to just acquire a deeper feeling around if you use them the right way so i mean really it seems odd but the theory really has helped me be a more expressive player because you know i can just internalize the theory in a much deeper way in my subconscious so that i can just forget about it and really just make music and you know and even in just a practical way of finding your way through a solo, it's way, way easier to incorporate a really, really simple idea than it is to incorporate a really, really big one. You know, if you're, if you're going along playing, you're like, oh man, I don't know what to do. It's way easier to jump on. And to try to like pull that one really big Stevie Ray Vaughan like that you practice out of your vocabulary. And when you're confused, jumping on just those two notes is way easier to get you going. You saw I just started out. Just playing with those two notes, but I was able to start to play more notes a little more fluidly after I kind of got that kickstart. And seeing things in terms of these really, really simple phrases gives you a jumping off point for no matter where you are. And you know, a lot, a lot of uh, people talking about blues improvisation are talking about two different ways of expanding your solos. You know, learning to play more notes 
or learning to play less notes but with more feeling. And the core phrases really help you do both. They help you go up and down and left and right because when you can see these uh, when you can see these core phrases in much bigger licks, then it gives you so many more ways to expand them than when you just had to think in these big, oh man, I'm going to try to put together this big lick I had from this song and from that song. But those bigger licks can be very, very cumbersome. But the smaller licks, they're much easier to manipulate. And then they give you such a greater appreciation for how powerful just two notes can be. When you spend all this time thinking about these really, really simple licks, you, it's just what I was saying before. You, you, they start to acquire much more of a character and much more of a personality. They, it feels like a lot more is going on with just a few notes. And it makes you feel way more comfortable just playing a really simple solo rather than a really, really complicated, flashy one. And so in every way I have found, you know, this idea of using the DNA phrases has helped me out. It doesn't it doesn't cancel out other kinds of playing. It just gives you more options of ways to look at it. Um, and then again, you know, if your goal is to be kind of nerdy, you know, I occasionally, you know, want to do nerdy stuff with my music theory. Uh, one of the later lessons that I'm going to do in this series is what I call a formula for blues influence. If you want to figure out, you know, how blues influence some type of music is, you can look for these core phrases and figure out what types of them are showing up and how often they're occurring. Because I mean, I'll tell you right now, you can look at a bunch of uh, at a bunch of these different blues artists, and in some of their songs, you'll find every single note in the song is part of a core blues lick. You can just make a score and bracket every single note as being, you know, one of these fundamental types of licks. And it's just like, you know, this intense blues concentrate. Whereas in a lot of mainstream pop styles of music, you'll, you'll find it, it's hard to get away from blues influence. It's found its way into so many kinds of music. But in types of music that aren't considered blues per se, it, it's not as common. You'll find the core phrases, but they're not as common, you know, and, and, and it'll help you kind of understand where an artist is coming from and how they construct their style and it'll give you a way to talk about it with other musicians. I've really found this this theory of mine to be really indispensable in terms of how I communicate my ideas to other musicians because it gives me such good language for talking about what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And so the next couple of videos I'm going to try to flesh as much of this out as I can. Right away I'm going to go into playing stuff. I'm going to talk about um, the two kinds of blues that I think of. The major blues and the minor blues. It's two different sets of these three types of phrases, but I'm going to give you as many of the types of core phrases as I can. I'm going to break down these three types of phrases into specific ways of playing as quick as I can, and then I'm going to give you my favorite exercise of all, the master DNA exercise, and it's going to show you how to work these into your playing so you can use the licks over the entire neck. And uh, after I've done gone into that, I'm going to start teaching you how to play more advanced, more complex licks with these, how to construct your own licks, um, again, I'll have that lesson for how to analyze for blues influence, and I, I've got a really interesting lesson coming up about how to get out of sticky situations in a solo. You know how everyone's into this idea of you know how you can always find a right note a half step away from a wrong note? Well, I'm going to have another really interesting exercise about how to play a fully chromatic blues where there's a lick for every single note in the in the 12 note chromatic scale. That's going to be a really fun lesson. And last of all, uh, I'm going to talk about how this this idea of the blues raga lets you kind of either stay within the context of the blues or go totally beyond it, how you can use the blues raga as kind of a landscape of figuring out what traditional blues artists have done, but also figuring out what they've never done before and how you can put your own stamp on ideas that have never been done before. You know, and, and it's all based on this idea of how you know, humans perceive intervals just because of the way their ears work. It's, you know, it's almost a science-based method of things, but it gives you just like unlimited creative potential. So all that stuff is coming up in kind of the, this mini-series on the DNA phrases. And then, you know, we'll go on with further in the Blues Raga series with sitar techniques of, you know, playing through the alap and the chor and the jala, through all the Indian forms. You know, all that stuff's going to come up later in the series. So all kinds of fun stuff to come. I hope you guys dig it all. Yeah. Peace out.